Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Candace Vinson. I am the Outreach and Events Coordinator here at VIMS and I'd like to welcome you to our final after hours of the year. Thank you so much for coming out. So let's get into our talk for this evening. Our lecture tonight will be given by Dr. Molly Mitchell, Research Assistant Professor at VIMS, and Joe Rieger, Deputy Director of Restoration with the Elizabeth River Project. Dr. Mitchell is a research uh, assistant professor and also the program director, director of our new Master of Arts degree program here at VIMS. She is a three-time William & Mary alumna, getting her bachelor's degree in biology and environmental science and her master's and PhD from mar in marine science here from the university. Her research focuses on shifts in coastal resources due to the interaction of sea level rise and human-driven changes. She works with decision makers and resource managers to translate research and current scientific understandings into practical recommendations. In her role as the MA program director, she oversees the implementation of VIM's newest professional degree program. And we are only in the second year of that. So it's a big workload. <laughs> Uh, Joe has worked for the nonprofit Elizabeth River Project for 18 years and acts as the Deputy Director of Restoration. He's managed numerous wetland, oyster, and sediment restoration projects in the Elizabeth and Lafayette Rivers. He was the project manager for the remediation of Money Point, which was the first nationally recognized community-led cleanup of contaminated sediments. He is also the project manager for oyster restoration in the Lafayette River, which became the first river in Virginia to meet Chesapeake Bay program restoration goals in 2018. His position involves working directly with federal and state governments, waterfront industries, universities, and the citizens of Hampton Roads, Virginia. Joe received his Bachelor of Science from Ohio University and received a master's degree in aquatic ecology from Old Dominion University. Joe and his wife, Casey, live on in Norfolk on the Lafayette River with their two sons, Walter and Lucas, who both enjoy baseball and fishing on the river. And in his free time, Joe likes to be in the mountains. And with that, I will turn it over to them. Great. So thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, Joe and I are going to pass this back and forth. Um, so I'm actually going to pass it off to him to get started. Um, but we're going to talk about what... Um, what drove uh, Elizabeth River to ask for this project, why they were interested in it. Um, so this was a collaboration that they brought to VIMS um, for us to do the creation, but the idea behind it was theirs. Um, and then we're gonna talk to you about how we made the tool and how it's being used, and then a brief demonstration of how it's gonna work. So I'm gonna pass it off to you, Joe, to talk about your project. Great, thanks, Molly. And thanks, Candace, for having um, me this this evening. Um, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. Well, uh, thanks for coming out tonight and um, talk a little bit about uh, the work that we do, why we developed this tool, and then the great work that uh, VIMS put into developing it and how we're using it now. All right. Uh, a little bit about our organization. Uh, Elizabeth River Project is a nonprofit. Uh, environmental group. We're um, uh, in Norfolk, and we've been around for about 30 years, and our mission is to restore the Elizabeth River to the highest practical extent, working in partnership with the government, industry, and also the community. So we're a little different than a lot of other uh, nonprofits. We don't go after businesses for polluting. We try to work with businesses to address the issues and look for projects and opportunities moving forward with them. And um, the topic we're gonna talk about tonight is environmental justice. And so this may be a new topic uh, or a new term or a new topic to, for you, but um, environmental justice is the, is the fair treatment and uh, meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, uh, national origin or income. And um, this has to also do with enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. So we're, we are located in Norfolk. There are a lot of environmental justice issues um, surrounding where communities are located, uh, especially near industrial sites, and then the pollution that they're exposed to because of the uh, emissions and or discharges from those facilities. 
along with not only that, but just regular infrastructure. So like highways coming through communities. And I'm going to give a couple examples of both of these in, um, the, in um, my talk here. But then um, talking a little bit about why we ended up uh, approaching Molly to develop this tool. So this here is a spot uh, fish, typical fish that you can catch here in Chesapeake Bay. And this research was actually done by a researcher here at BIMS, Maury Roberts, Dr. Maury Roberts, for those who may, uh, may know that name. Uh, Dr. Roberts uh, collected some uh, sediments from Money Point, which is in the southern branch of, of the Elizabeth River, and exposed a uh, spot to them for uh, up to 48 hours. And within 24 hours, they had these lesions that you see on, on its belly and then the fin rot that you see on its tail. And then by 48 hours, um, he had replicates of this. Um, all the species, I mean, all the uh, spot had died and all the replicates after 48 hours. And so this led us to determine that Money Point might be a good opportunity for us to take that approach, working with businesses in the community and industry to clean up Money Point. And so we set off about, this has been about um, 12 years ago. We set off working with the community uh, the industry to come up with a plan of how we could clean up this contaminated site, doing it outside of the Superfund site uh, uh, program without any regulatory oversight to do it um, as, as inexpensively as possible, as effectively as possible, but at the same time showing improvements in the environment. And so um, we were able to one, uh, hold a, a ton of public meetings and, uh, and get feedback from the community about what they wanted to see happen in the community, um, how they wanted the cleanup to, to move forward. Um, and the feedback we got, it was that not only did they want the cleanup, but they wanted a whole bunch of other amenities to occur at the same time. So we developed a, a small watershed plan for this uh, little peninsula in, in Chesapeake. And we actually moved forward with the cleanup. On the right-hand side, you've seen the removal of uh, of the contaminated uh, sediments out of the bottom of the river. That's a sheen that's coming off of it. And on the right-hand side at the bottom, this is the creosote. So this used to be an old creosote company that um, produced uh, this black tar that they put on telephone poles that you see on the streets um, still today. Uh, marine application is no longer really used. But the reason they used it was an insecticide and it prevented boring organisms in the water and the sediments uh, from breaking down that wood. Very effective. But at the same time, it's carcinogenic, causing cancer in fish. And Dr. Mike Unger here at Vims has shown these high rates of cancer in these little mummy chugs because they're living in this type of, of uh, uh, environment. So what we were doing is that we uh, worked on the cleanup and, and kept engaging with the community to under, understand what are the things they wanted to see happen. And we were able to do a bunch of stormwater projects, beautification projects, and that was all interacting you know, with the community and, and getting feedback for, and also with the industrial uh, players. Uh, this is the uh, First, Baptist, um, uh, First Baptist Money Point Church. Uh, kind of like an interesting backstory to tell, tell you about what happened here is Money Point, the creosote factory was actually there prior to any community. And then um, what happened is it, the community started uh, living um, about a mile and a half away from the creosote site. And then um, what happened is a highway was driven straight through the community. It was a primarily, uh, a pri primarily African-American community. Um, and then that cut them off from the rest of what's now South Norfolk. And when that happened, they basically zoned all these residents as industrial so that they could no longer do improvements on their home. They were kind of trapped in this industrial location. And they were then, um, um, almost everyone was forced, a lot of people were forced to sell their homes and uh, for industrial use. There are still three or four homes there. There's a 90 year old lady that lives next to a car crushing facility and you know, exposed to all the metal and also PCBs and, um, from that car crushing activity. So this is the example I'm giving um, as an environmental justice issue. Um, and 
what happened though out of this, which, which was great, is that we started, the site got cleaned up, we had all this beautification that happened and we actually saw cancer levels in the mummy chug go down because of this effort. Another project we worked on was in Paradise Creek. This is on the Southern Branch also. Um, this, little, uh, this little branch had four super fun sites on it, which super fun sites are like the worst of the worst cleanup sites that um, EPA lists. We worked with the community to develop a watershed plan for this little creek. And something we heard loud and clear is that I wanted more open space and area uh, to enjoy the outdoors and to go because it was such an industrialized uh, area around the community. And so uh, they also wanted to see these super fun sites turn into the open areas. So uh, you can see across the creek there, those two open grassy areas, those are two closed super fun sites. We work with the Navy and the community uh, work with the Navy to come up with a plan to leave it as open space. And then we ended up working with um, the state and purchased this 40 acre dredge disposal facility, and then uh, turned it into Portsmouth's third largest uh, park and then handed it over to, to the city of Portsmouth, where, they, where we now do a lot of programming like you see here, which um, on the bottom, this is the Youth Conservation Corps that we uh, have in the summer with uh, graduates, P uh, um, young people who are getting ready to graduate uh, from Icy Norcom High School. And the idea is to engage them to um, become interested in the environment and then ultimately to have more people of color in the environmental field. Um, I think that uh, Molly and I were talking, you know, our, our field is not diverse at all. You know, if you look around this room who's attending this talk, it's not diverse at all. So we're trying to change that and trying to get more people of color into this field and interested in this type of work. The Learning Barge is another platform that we use um, to engage uh, school age children. So this barge is a steel deck barge that we built. It's um, totally off the grid. And the concept is that we bring students in from the traditional classroom and give them a non-traditional um, uh, experience out on the water, talking about jobs that are on the water, why it's important to clean up the river and the cool animals that are in the water and to do some water quality testing. And so all Norfolk fourth graders come to this barge. We get grants. The biggest thing is busing, believe it or not. We have to pay for all the busing for all the students to come. So we uh, struggle to do that, but we have been able to pull that off. And this is a free program. Um, Norfolk has um, the, highest, um, the highest concentration of poverty in the state. And so a lot of these kids have never been on the river. It's the first time, you know, out seeing all these animals that they, um, you know, you can just see their eyes will light up when they, when, when they have this experience. So this is what we're trying to offer to more uh, kids throughout Hampton Roads that are from underserved communities. So in those three examples I gave you, those were opportunities that we kind of, you know, we went to the places that were the worst of the worst for contamination. And it wasn't driven by community um, because of environmental justice issues necessarily. It was where the contamination was or opportunities were. So we'll, um, we started working with Wetlands Watch, which is another nonprofit in Norfolk. And what we started looking at with them is, could we target specifically underserved communities and come up with these plans for either cleanup or restoration and, and, and look at a good model that get more, um, more involvement. And so what we did is uh, Wetlands Watch developed this collaboratory. We would go into communities that we identified and the three that we went into uh, was Chesterfield Heights and uh, um, in Ingleside and also Poplar Hall. And what we ended up doing, actually the Chesterfield Heights project that uh, Wetlands Watch did ended up turning into the Norfolk's Ohio Creek project, which was a hundred and uh, I think it was a hundred and twenty million dollar project to stop the flooding that was occurring in this community. And so um, that was a project that was a bunch of students had an idea and it turned into a hundred and twenty million dollar project. Uh, Ingleside, we ended up uh, working with that community and we were able to leverage about two million dollars to do 
some stormwater improvements in the neighborhood that the community wanted. And then uh, right now we're working, we're still working on Poplar Hall, but we've got a number of wetland restoration projects. So again, these were where we were very deliberate now and, and working with, in underserved communities and not, not looking just for the most contaminated site. But what we started to ask the question was, um, you know, are, is there a better way to do this? Well, in 2020 during COVID, um, we started saying, you know, we got to put more of our money where our mouth is with, you know, working in these communities. So we, we made these commitments and we, to this day, are still striving to accomplish them. But um, the third one, I'm oh, sorry, the, um, the first one uh, gets at the nexus of what we're going to talk about tonight. And that is to develop some type of tool which we could understand in these communities, what are the driving factors? What are the potential driving factors that need to be addressed? You know, is it flooding? Is it tree canopy? Is it contaminated sites? Is it restoration? And so that's where we then came to VIMS and asked VIMS, you know, can you help us meet this first commitment of developing this tool so that we can use it and be effective at working in underserved communities? So um, then the, one, uh, the second one is to have a more diverse staff and board, and we are working on that. Uh, we are at, adding more people uh, of color and diversity to our board and our staff. We're, we're um, working to add more staff uh, diversity also. So those are items that are still underway. And then the internships that, I mentioned, that are mentioned here, um, through some of the money that VIMS gets from the state and also Norfolk State, we were able to have um, uh, two to three interns at least a year working with us. And the goal is to introduce them to the environmental career early on and like freshman, so sophomore year, so that they would have an interest in potential jobs in those fields. And so that's been a, a very successful program and we're gonna continue that. Um, so that led us into you know, that first commitment that we had was asking if VIMS would develop the tool. And I'm going to hand this back over to Molly to talk about how her uh, group did that. Thank you. Yeah, so the first thing we had to figure out building a tool like this was what are the questions that the Elizabeth River Project needs to answer when they're um, looking for their planning and their efforts. So to do this, we worked with the leadership. We worked with Joe a lot. Um, the staff, and also they were doing um, their five-year plan at that point. So they had an environmental justice and equity subcommittee that was specifically looking at these issues and how Elizabeth River could address them. So they helped us also to try to figure out what it was this tool needed to contain. Um, and so the, the overall goal was this holistic consideration of your social and environmental setting. Um, so basically everything. Um, so we had um, environmental resources in there. So this includes things like urban tree canopy, areas where you could put in wetlands, areas where wetlands currently are, okay, and then areas where there's restoration opportunities for them, um, public green spaces, salt marshes, freshwater wetlands, so all the environmental resources that exist. Then the environmental stressors, um, so this is predominantly flooding data. So um, FEMA flood data, storm surge data from storm surge models, sea level rise um, data. So how is it gonna change over time? Then we had social indices. Um, so EJ screen is an EPA product and that was a big thing that this, this was built around. So I'm gonna talk more about EJ screen in a moment. We also had composite social vulnerability indices. Um, so these are indices that just say how vulnerable is a community in general. Um, we have the redlining layers. So these are um, neighborhoods that were subject to historical mortgage practices that discouraged home ownership by African Americans. And these um, have been recognized as still shaping our communities to a large extent today. Um, we have societal stressors. Okay, so these are the human induced stressors, Superfund and Brownfield sites. Uh, permitted outfalls for domestic sewage, industrial stormwater outfalls, um, and then infrastructure, so law enforcement, medical facilities, schools, and also things like shoreline stabilization, piers, water access, that kind of thing. So, um, so we put all of this into a tool. So the, the 
the great thing about this, um, doing this in a digital format. So years ago, we probably could have written a report for Joe that had all this information and came down to a conclusion. Um, but the, the, this tool is live, okay? So we've already updated it once when EPA put out new EJ screen data and information. So it can be updated, the data in it, but also new pieces of data can be added if there's new questions that come up that need to be answered. Okay, so I promised you a little background on EJ screen. Um, like I said, this is an EPA product and it uses what they call vulnerability factors. So these are factors that induce health risk that are beyond a person's biology. So things like economic standing. Um, they're available in what they call block groups. So these are census groupings and they can be between 600 and 3000 people. In a city, these are relatively small blocks. So they're relatively discrete areas in a city. Um, in Gloucester, they're bigger. Um, and if you move out into rural areas, there are actually some counties that only have a couple block groups in the entire county. Um, they're percentile based. So what they're not telling you a exact number, they're telling you how that community compares to other communities, either in the region or in the United States. Um, so if it says it has a score of 80%, that means that 20% of the US block groups are worse off than that community, okay. Um, and this has been used uh, not just by the EPA, but a number of states have created their own composite indices and derivative products. Um, so it's actually, it's, this is a very um, well-received product and well-vetted product. Um, so the things we included from EJ Screen, so there are six demographic indicators that EJ Screen uses. So it's um, low income, uh, percent minority, less than high school education, linguistic isolation, which really means not English speaking, um, or not predominantly English speaking, individuals under five, and individuals over 64. So those are the six demographic indicators. Then they have 11 environmental indicators. And these um, environmental indicators are things like um, air toxins and ozone um, levels and lead paint indicators. So that's particularly in older houses where you have a lot of lead paint, um, proximity to treatment and storage disposal. So there's these 11 environmental indicators. Okay, and then they have these 11 EJ indices. And what these are is if they take the um, percent low income and the percent minority, and they say, okay, where, so where are the areas where you have high um, low income and high minority populations? And then you have how high is the indicator? Okay, and so that is combined to make an EJ index. Um, and so when you have these EJ indices, high values there, then you have um, multiple different types of, um, uh, you have both environmental issues and you have the demographic um, indicators also. Okay, so this is um, what the tool looks like and we're gonna actually show it to you live in a little bit so you can get a better view because it's, it's hard to see here. But um, this is basically what it looks like. So it's got a map side where you can turn layers on and off and you can compare information. And then it has a dashboard side where it summarized some of the information for you. Okay, and this is what the dashboard side looks like. It's got, um, so this is the demographic indicators and this is the environmental indicators. Right now on the map, you can only see the demographic indicators because the environmental indicators are underneath them. Um, but as you zoom in and out on the map, it will actually change, this graph will change to show you the proportion of each category within the view of the um, dashboard. And one of the other things that is in there is um, a crossover between your environmental and your demographic. So these, this map up here is showing these colors, okay? So if you have this light green color, you've got a high environmental vulnerability and a high demographic vulnerability, okay? So vulnerable in both categories. And the dark blue is a low environmental vulnerability and a low demographic vulnerability. And then the, the two other colors are one is high and one is low. Um, so 
in this, you can see kind of the distribution across the Elizabeth River watershed. Um, and you can see there are these areas that are all kind of clustered um, together that have both high environmental and high demographic vulnerability. And then there's also a layer, this is down in this map, where we've pulled out just the census blocks that have both high environmental and high um, demographic vulnerability. So you can look at where these fall and then put other things on top of them. And um, Joe's going to show you more about how they've actually used that. So I'm going to hand it back to him. Great, thanks. Um, so the, the really uh, nice thing about this is that the new census data has been included. So this has been updated. So this is 2020 data. Uh, before we were working with 2019-ish data. So, um, so it, it's up to date. And what we can do with this is then go in and say, okay, the demographic data and the environmental data, those areas, wh where are those areas located? And then also ask the question, how does like tree canopy look compared to that? Does it have low tree canopy? Because we know a lot of underserved communities do not have extensive tree canopy. And, um, and, and so you, some of these areas that, that then pop out, as you can see up here, you can start looking at like Huntersville and Norfolk, um, Berkeley, and, uh, Berkeley and Norfolk, Norfolk Highlands and Chesapeake. So these are areas where we could then say, okay, well, we could um, work with these communities and, and see if there was any appetite to increase tree canopy which we know if you increase, uh, increase tree canopy, it reduce, reduces your reliance on air conditioning. It offers a more uh, welcoming place to, to live. And it also cools off the, that, that particular area because of the, we have the urban heat island uh, phenomena in Norfolk. So that's basically, you have so much concrete or impervious area that your temperature is always you know, anywhere from five to 10 degrees higher compared to somewhere like here in Gloucester. Um, a big one in Hampton Roads, and I'm sure all of you heard this, is the flooding issues, right? So then you can start asking questions with this EJ tool about where you have the demographic vulnerability and the environmental vulnerability, where are these communities and how are they gonna be impacted by sea level rise in 2070, using the intermediate high scenario, which is what is being used now. So that's just the, the scenario that we think it's uh, the, how high the sea is gonna rise by 2027 and uh, we're using this one curve. And so you can start then looking at here are communities that are really vulnerable because of that. And that's like Berkeley, uh, Campostella area and Norfolk. And what's interesting about um, th this, this Berkeley area is that they're also, one of the highest concentrations of store, uh, fuel storage tanks in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so you start then asking questions like, well, you know, the one of the largest oil spills in the United States, uh, like the fourth or fifth largest oil spill in the United States was Hurricane Katrina because of all the fuel uh, facilities that leaked. And that has a poten major potential impact on these, uh, on these um, uh, communities. And so, you know, the, the, using this, you can then start, like another thing we could start mapping is what's the density of, of, um, of these storage tanks at these sites. And so it offers you the opportunity to start overlaying different factors that can have impacts on the community. And then when you go in to work with the community, you, you have an idea of what you can be addressing and, 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 and then show the community, like, look, this is the data that we have um, for sea level rise, and here are all the facilities that are going to be impacted, and there, you know, that flood water could potentially end up in the neighborhood. So then that allows us then to start working with industries and the neighborhood to try to come up with solutions to prevent that from happening. Um, and, and this is just another, this is just the uh, same area, but down in um, the southern branch. And something I just wanted to point out is kind of the neighborhoods I mentioned, um, both in Paradise Creek and at Money Point, they all show up green, right? So this goes back to the kind of the original discussion I had is we were working in gr these, these lime green areas, which are these uh, social and vulnerable and environmentally vulnerable neighborhoods. 
Uh, but we got there because of the contamination in the bottom of the river, not because we were like making this conscious effort to say, okay, we want to work in these communities because of environmental justice issues. With this tool, we can do that and better understand those. And then um, just up, um, if you see where it says Newtown and that area, that's up by um, uh, Paradise Creek Nature Park that I mentioned. And then over on the Eastern Branch, which uh, was, was shown earlier, where the learning barge is, that's another community, that's the Chesterfield Heights community, which is also this fine green. So, um, you know, this is just another tool that will help us in the future. And one thing that we were able to use this on, as Molly mentioned, is we have our watershed action plan, which is like our map that we develop of what we wanna do and set short-term and long-term goals um, uh, for the river over time. And we just completed that and Molly was uh, participating with that. We had about a, 120 uh, people, uh, citizens, uh, scientists, state officials, federal officials. This is our fifth uh, revision, and we usually do it after what we do, uh, State of the River. The State of the River kind of tells us how the river is doing, and based off of that, we develop this overall plan of actions we want to uh, do. Um, and it, this is our restoration plan, and it provides the guidance to the community. So it's developed by the community. It's their plan. It's not just Elizabeth River Project's plan. Um, and then we have an independent facilitator uh, that helped us with uh, Frank Dukes from the Institute of Environmental uh, Negotiations and also uh, University of Maryland's uh, Environmental Finance Center helped us uh, say, okay, if you have all these ambitious ideas, how are you gonna fund them? And so uh, the Environmental Justice Committee, kind of the first five-year goal is one, is to, we got that one done, right? Check that off, but it, you develop this tool and start using it. And then this one that we're working on right now is developing this replicable um, Bay model for engagement and empowering these underserved communities to do it respectfully and to have it be their plan. You know, it, you know we don't want to go into uh, underserved communities and say, okay, here is a white person here to tell you exactly how you're gonna fix all your problems. We want this to actually be a, a plan that they want to support and that they understand kind of what the factors are that are contributing to these EJ issues and then make decisions and say, okay, we think that we want to take these types of actions to address them. And to help us with this, is we've been partnering with Norfolk State University, uh, pri pr uh, primarily at African American univer uh, uh, University for the last three and a half years. We built a strong relationship with them and we applied for a National Fish and Wildlife Grant, grant for a million dollars and it was awarded to us in, in Norfolk State. And Norfolk State will be getting half of that money and we'll be using our half to do implementation and they will use their half to develop a center for engagement into underserved communities. And then we, at the same time, we had University of Virginia come to um, Norfolk State and, and say, hey, there's this National Science Foundation grant we could apply for it to kind of add to this other grant. And um, they were we, they received that and half of that will go to Norfolk State. And so what we're gonna be doing is picking three communities using this tool. And then, uh, and then once those communities have been chosen and, and they're and willing to work with us, uh, Norfolk State and us will work with them to come up with a plan for what they wanna do to address either flooding or if it's additional habitat or tree canopy, we'll then have some funds available to help address some of those issues. And with that, I think your demonstration of how to use the tool. I'm gonna to show you, this is, so this is the tool. Um, and I wanna take a minute here as we go down to it to um, just really um, mention my colleague, Tammy Rudnicki, who actually built this because she stuffed an amazing amount of information into a single tool. So she, she did an amazing job. Um, so when you come into the tool, it comes up with, this is the watershed of the um, Elizabeth River uh, boundary, the boundary of the Elizabeth River watershed. And uh, it comes up with the percent low income here. Um, so this is, what it looks like when you open it. But then over on this side is all the categories of things that you can look at um, and consider. And I'm gonna just show you a couple of them um, because there's, there's so much that you can look at. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and 
go down, start by going down to the demographics and opening this up. So you remember I said that there were six EJ screen um, demographic categories. And so you can turn on any of these. Um, these are um, the bottom layer so that anything else that comes up over it is above it. Um, and so then that makes it easier to see how things overlay. Let me turn that off. Okay, so all the layers, they're like, you have to think of them literally as layers. So if you turn on something below it, it won't show unless the thing above it is turned off. Okay. Um, so we can also um, go up and turn on the waterway so that you guys can figure out where you are. Um, I'm gonna turn off. These are public and private access points. So piers and docks, that kind of thing. And then these are um, bulkheads, riprap, revetments, and living shorelines. But I'm just gonna turn that off, but just so you can see where the water comes in, where the Elizabeth River itself comes in. Um, so there are, are a lot of things we can do here, um, but if we wanted to go down and look at where there are discharge outfalls and we can zoom in to an area. Over here, we have the legend and it shows us that the dark red is where we have um, high minority populations and the light pink is where we have low minority populations. Um, so we can zoom into an area and then if you were actually to click on one of these outfalls, it will tell you what the outfall is. Um, and it gives you a permit number. So you can actually go look this up with the state and find out what that permit's actually for. Um, and then the next thing it will do is give you information about the census block. Um, so this is just a, a general breakdown of the demographics, um, but then there's some more detailed information that is inside. And it tells us also that the census block, the population has decreased since uh, the 2014, 2018. Um, the percent people of color has gone up slightly um, during that time. So this gives us a little information about how things have changed since the, um, since the previous census. Um, this is the American Community Survey. So these are the, uh, not the big census efforts, these are the um, between census. Um, okay, so other things that we can look at, um, we talked about the restoration opportunities. So these are areas where you could um, build a living shoreline where it's a suitable area to build a living shoreline. And if you click on it, it'll actually tell you quite a bit about it. Um, it recommends a non-structural living shoreline. So you don't need riprap in front of the shoreline. The potential site's 323 feet long by eight feet wide. Um, and it provides benefits for nutrient reduction, uh, habitat continuity. So that means it's linking marshes together if you put a living shoreline in there. Um, it will help break wave energy for buildings that are located behind it. And it's in, because it's in a area of high social vulnerability, it will help, it'll benefit socially vulnerable communities in particular. Um, so this is um, the type of information that you can find. The other thing, I'm gonna turn this off really quickly because it's red also, so this is gonna make it hard to see. Um, so we talked about the red line information. And so I wanna show you what that looks like. So these are the um, 1940 red line neighborhoods. And again, if you click on one of them, it will tell you its classification, um, where it's located and why it was, how it was described that way. And so why was it given the classification it was given in the redlining information? Um, you can also, Instead of that, you can turn on the actual images. So this is the original map that was there. And then another really important feature of this is this is not data we developed. Um, and so in each of these, some of this is data we developed, but some of it's not, uh, the redlining is not. Um, you see this little, little eye on the side. If you click on that, it will tell you, um, down here, this data set's been extracted from the mapping inequality redlining in New Deal America data. And this is the website where you can go and learn more about that project. And this is where you can download that data also. Um, okay, so 
then I just want to show you also the um, sea level rise and storm surge information. So if we go back up here to the infrastructure, we can turn this on. And this shows us where all our infrastructure is. And then if we were also to say, where are our low income populations? Um, okay, so then we can go into our sea level rise and you see with the sea level rise, the first thing we get across the bottom, I'm gonna put this down just so it's, is um, a slider and you can't see on the screen, there's actually um, dates, it's, it's hidden below this. There's um, dates down, well, maybe I can move this up a little bit so you can see. There we go, okay. Uh, yeah, it just snapped right back down. Okay, there's actually dates down there. And so you can move this and it will, um, you can see over time how sea level's changing. And so we can go in and we can see what kind of infrastructure um, might be impacted by sea level rise. So this is um, where the, these, these are areas that will be underwater at whatever time um, you're looking at, okay? Um, and the different colors of the water indicate the depth of the water. But anything that's blue here is something that will be underwater. Um, so that you can look through the sea level rise and look at that. Um, the other thing we have here is storm surge models. So this is a category one storm surge. Anything that's colored is an area that will flood. The different colors indicate different depths of flooding. Um, if we look at our current storm, it's not gonna be a four when it hits us, but it was briefly there for a while. We can see what that would look like if it hit the Elizabeth River. Um, yeah, that's not pretty. We'll turn that off. Um, and then the last piece is the um, FEMA 100 year floodplain. So this is showing us um, the areas where you would need flood insurance if you were, um, if you had a mortgage. Okay, so that, that's, I mean, there's a lot more stuff in there, um, but that is basically how this tool works. The only other thing I just wanted to show you quickly is I told you there was both a map viewer, which is this piece, and then there's the dashboards. There are two things that the dashboards show us. So these are the same data from the previous one. There's just very specific information. So there's the demographics and the indicators. So this is the six EJ screen demographics. And you can change which one is being shown here. Right now it's um, the percent low income is what's being shown, but you can go and you can put any of these on. Um, and then these are in the view, these are the breakdowns of each of the things. Um, and so if you see the thing on the bottom actually changed, the graph on the bottom actually changed as I zoomed in because it changed the, in the view, how many things were being shown in each category. Then the other one is the indicators. So these indicators are composites. Okay, so they tell you, right, where you have high demographic vulnerability or where you have high environmental vulnerability or where you have them cross over. They don't tell you is what that vulnerability is. Um, so they're telling you, you have multiple vulnerabilities if you have high vulnerability, but we don't know what it is. So it makes it harder to address the root cause of it. So both of these uh, ways of looking at social vulnerability are very important. Um, so these, we know these are very highly vulnerable areas. They have multiple vulnerabilities, social vulnerabilities. Um, but then we need to go back to the demographics to break down what it is, is about this community that makes it vulnerable. All right, so that is all. I really had to show you with the demonstration, but I um, recommend you take some time and play around with it if you're interested in it. And I just wanted to share this up here at the end. Um, so this is mine and Joe's contact information. So we're gonna take questions now, um, but we're also always happy to um, answer questions and have people reach out to us. So thank you guys so much. Hi guys, this is Allie and I'm gonna be asking a question from the online chat. 
Uh, do you see a direct increase with employment with the internship program to get students who normally wouldn't consider this field? So this is our third third year of doing the um, the youth conservation core, and um, we we've had I think three or four students that went into um, related a related field or you know into an environmental field. Um, unfortunately, when we started, it kind of hit also with COVID, so we haven't. It was really tough. Um, they, this this year was the first kind of full go where we had uh, students there all summer long. Um, so, you know, kind of the jury's still out on that, but um, I can tell you that their interest, even with the intern program that we have with Norfolk State, uh, the interest of the students are, uh, is a lot higher than when they first come in because uh, I know the Norfolk State students really don't know what they're in for at first. Um, and they get a chance to work in the field with uh, the staff who put in living shorelines, rain barrels, um, rain gardens, and then also they have to do a, like a, ca a capstone project too. So a lot of it's on uh, water quality uh, work and uh, VIMS has uh, two long-term monitoring stations that Willie Ray maintains down in Norfolk. So they do a lot of their um, uh, they collect a lot of data from that uh, that monitoring system, and, and that's, they do some analysis to develop a final report. So, um, and then the one at the park, I think that one has has had more success because they're high school students. You know, uh, what we found is that high school students they may have they haven't made their mind up really what they wanted to do yet. Versus um, at Norfolk State, a lot of the students that we were getting, especially um, further in their academic career had already made decisions on going in to like become a doctor or a nurse or a, a, another field that wasn't the environmental field. So that's been harder not to crack, but we're still working on that. Um, but now the goal is freshmen, sophomores, rather than junior seniors to get them into that program. So I have a quick question about the floating barge. Does that actively go to different areas or is it sort of stationary just in the water or can you visit different communities if funding would allow yeah so that's a good question so it needs a tug to move um it's not self-propelled but it does it, it can move around um so for a while when we were in portsmouth it was in front of our office down in portsmouth uh then for a while it was down in chesapeake and then it's been at grandy village over on the eastern branch probably for the last five or six years, they built a dock specifically for that. Um, we are now kind of looking at another location too over in Chesapeake at the end of the Jordan Bridge. Um, Chesapeake's interested in hosting it there too. So it can move around, but it, it, it has to have a dock uh, sometimes somewhere to, because of Coast Guard regulations, you can't like, you know, put it out in the middle of the water and then take the kids out to it. So it has to have a permanent dock. And then once they go there, it has to be inspected by the Coast Guard uh, to make sure it's safe for the, the students to come out on. Last one real quick from online, is the tool available online and where? Yes, the tool is available online. Um, so this is the address of the tool. Honestly, the easiest way to find it is to Google Elizabeth River Project EJ tool, and it is the first thing that will come up. But this is the web address for it. Thank you both so much. This was absolutely fascinating. I did want to ask, what are your plans for advertising or showcasing this to stakeholders? Is this something you want to take to local government, state government, maybe even federal? What does that next stage look like for you all? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm going to um, let Joe weigh in because it's, it's really his tool. But one of the things we talked about that that uh, that Elizabeth River Project was interested in, it was how school systems could use this to teach students about um, environmental justice. And so I think that would actually be a great way to advertise its uh, capabilities. Yeah, um, and I think you guys are uh, we applied for a grant recently to do that to use it in the schools um it's been a little bit tougher to get um 
the politicians interested in it. But what we would like to try to do is get um, a lot more of like planning, the planning departments involved. Um, but it, it's, to be honest with you, we, we could do a much better job. We've, we've had a, um, there were a couple of articles that ran in the mm -hmm. pilot. We, we've had some coverage on it, but um, we haven't, like gone around to each of the cities and, and shown the power that it has and that's something that we um, we could definitely do and we need to do but it's something that we need to definitely work on now especially now that it's updated before i felt like it felt i don't know how much it actually changed but some of the outdated data now that it's updated i think that it's you know a lot more powerful and then some additions that were added to it mm -hmm. recently and something we should mention is that it's supposed to be a dynamic tool, right? So um, there, we're hoping that there's a little bit of funding every year to update it where if there's layers that, if you get it too big, as Molly said, it gets all clunky and hard to use. So if people are like, well, I like the one is like vessels that are sunken, I think that yeah. are up there. You know, this, that's pretty old data. We probably could pull that off and if we wanted to add something else. So we're always looking for um, you know, if, if someone's using it and it's something that they, they think would be helpful, mm -hmm. we'd love to hear suggestions because we want it to change and improve over time. Yeah, and I just want to add to that really quickly. We do actually, um, so this is the only environmental justice focused tool we've ever made, but we do include EJ Industries in most of the other tools that we make for the state. Um, so that that can be brought into their considerations. So. Okay, we have some more questions from online. Um, first, there are other several tools for environmental justice developed in the state. Did you benchmark uh, with these to extract the best features? So um, it, it'd be great to see who wrote that and maybe we can get put in touch with them. One of the reasons why we developed this tool was because um, when you get to the granulation of the EPA, uh, the EPA model, it didn't have a lot of the information for the Elizabeth River watershed for like flooding or tree canopy, things like that. So um, if there's other state EJ tools, if the, that person might be able to share that with, with myself or Molly, we'd be very interested in it. Talking with DEQ, uh, Department of Environmental Quality, uh, when we were working with the EJ um, director um, a while back, he had said that one had not been developed for the state yet, and that this was a good model for what the state could uh, might be looking at. So. I'd love to see where, where those other ones are so that we can take a look at it and see what we could incorporate into this one. Lovely. And maybe we'll end on one last question, which is, this is a very interesting mapping model. Even though it would take a lot of effort, could something like this eventually be implemented across the country? Um, yes. I mean, as long as the data exists um, and so collecting the data sets is, is a huge part of the effort. Um, and then fitting them all into a tool that is relatively streamlined and navigable is the other big part of the effort. Um, but certainly those are um, both replicatable and could be, could be done anywhere. I do think it's helpful for us and I think it helped Molly out is if you're kind of looking for a specific, you know, you have a specific target in mind, like we developed this for that watershed action plan to go through that process and to use it to look at like restoration opportunities or tree canopy or flooding. Um, you know, a lot of times if you have these really robust tools that are all like they're hard to get through because there's so much data, it can, it can t users, it can scare a user, mm. right? I mean, this is kind of scary even to me, <laughs> right? Once you get in it, you start learning, learning how to do it. But if you had something that was non-specific and it had like everything in it, you know, I don't, it, it could, it may not be as helpful as something that's more specific or watershed specific. Um, and that's why we wanted it just for the Elizabeth River watershed is so that we could use it and get that, get that, um, that fine of focus on, on the data. Okay.
If there's no more, I'm going to ask one last question, just okay. sort of <laughs> as people who maybe aren't necessarily policymakers, how can people in the audience or who will view this later support the work that you're doing here? Um, one thing you'd always do is become a, a member of ERP, uh, go to Elizabeth River Project and, and become a member. And with that, you'll get updates of all the, uh, the, the good work we're doing, uh, which are highlighted in there usually uh, most of the, a lot of the stuff that I just uh, discussed. Um, and then also, you know, we have a number of, and, and I know you got most people, I don't know if most people are from Gloucester here, but, uh, you know, we have a, a number of um, committees that if you have a specialty, you know, within our organization, we, um, we are, we we're just about ready to adopt. So we have like a, a technical policy committee that works on technical policy, environmental policy, and like comments on major developments. But now we have a um, diversity and um, uh, inclusion um, committee, who, which will become a formal committee of the Elizabeth River Projects Board. Um, and so there's the opportunity to participate on there. So it uh, depends on what your interest is. Um, so we have you know, the volunteer opportunities in the field or with our, our, uh, with our uh, committees or um, through donations. Um, or, you know, a lot of times to come out and volunteer with us and we, something I didn't go over, you know, we put in marshes all the time and we need people to push a lot of sand. <laughs> so you can contact me and, um, feel free to contact me or email me or call me and we can, I can go over those opportunities with you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell and Joe. And while this is our last after hours of the year, we do have a special guest lecture happening Wednesday, November 16th. Nainoa Thompson, president and CEO of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. He is a, an ocean scholar in residence here at VIMS. He will be joining us once again in person. I don't think he's been here since 2015, since he sailed over on the Hukulea, if you recall that. So he will be giving a special guest lecture in this auditorium and online at 7 p.m. And we hope you can join us then. And if not, we'll see you in January. Thank you so much.